Hey everybody and welcome to Don't Copy That Floppy. I'm your host Lex. And I'm your other host Dan. Oh, Keep we're a video... Going. Keep it going! Pick up! Pick up the face! <laughs> um, we're a video game news podcast broadcasting live on Fridays from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That is correct. Not today, though. Not today. It's it's mostly correct. <laughs> today is a Saturday, however. Uh, as opposed to our usual Friday evening uh, experience. <laughs> experience. I'm going to call it an experience. I'm going to settle on that term. Um, we have a whole bunch of stuff to talk about. Uh, we've got some developments in a long, now I'd say a long-standing feud. Oh, yeah. Between critic and developer of video game, a particular video game. Uh, got some new news from Valve. They added again. They're doing it again. But now more confusing now than ever. Far more confusing than it was before. And I don't think that's just because I don't play Dota 2. I think it's actually really confusing. I think it's actually, yeah. Uh, some news about GDC, the Game Developers Conference, which uh, just happened recently. I can't remember the exact date, but I'm sure it's in there somewhere. Um, it was in the last week. Uh, a little bit of Xbox news, a little bit of Nintendo news, a whole bunch of VR news, particularly about the Oculus and the PlayStation VR, um, as well as a little bit of news about Telltale Games. And a little bit of news about everybody's favorite guy, J.J. J. Abrams. J.J. Abrams. J.J. Abrams. As we like to call of the Star him. Wars. The Force gets up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we'll end off with a uh, look at video games that are releasing in the next week or so. Um, as we usually do. So, Lex, why don't you take us into the latest in this odyssey of... Uh, latest story in this odyssey of... Developer critic drama. Uh, as we heard from Kotaku Australia, this is just replacing our, all our Konami Kojima stories at this point. Sort of is because we, we, we're kind of done with. We'll that. see if it now keeps amping this. up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. We learned from Kotaku Australia on March eighteenth. I like them much better than regular Kotaku. Yeah, <laughs> that dot au really makes the difference. Really makes it. Uh, they they reported that. Uh, Everybody's favorite video game YouTube reviewer, Jim Sterling, bis- despite his questionable fashion sense, <laughs> um, is a pretty cool guy. And, and brash opinions. And brash opinions. So brash. Um, is embroiled now in a lawsuit with Digital Homicide. Who you may know or not know as uh, the developer behind horribly unpopular game Slaughtering Ground? I believe that's the title of the game. I think you're right, yeah. yeah. Um, A terrible, terrible, terrible shooting, first-person shooting game, which Jim Sterling came out and said was terrible. (laughs) In no uncertain terms. Now, this all started, like, in I think like in 2014 or something. I was going to say, this is at least a year ago. It started a while started. back that he made a video saying, like, and we've reported on this in the past. This video. game is terrible. Yeah, he made a video saying this game's terrible, he showed gameplay, and it was terrible. Yeah, and don't um, buy it. Yeah, and then Digital Homicide uh, were so upset that they made a rebuttal YouTube video where they reviewed his review. Yeah. Uh, then he made a rebuttal video where he reviewed their, their review, review of his, his review. review. Uh, at that and so point, on and so forth. Yeah, at that point, the internet got uh, involved and <laughs> sent a bunch of the uh, internet at large. Yeah, pretty no, pretty much. Yeah. That a bunch of people went to the Steam page for Slaughtering Ground and just blasted it with negative reviews to the point that the game was a- reviewed accurately. <laughs> 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 then, um, <laughs> oh no! Uh, and then there was this whole thing with like Jim Sterling had like the CEO of uh, Digital Homicide like on a podcast with him, and they tried to hash it out, but and it was of, just real awkward. Yeah, instead of actually coming to a resolution, they just yelled at each other for a while, and it was really awkward. Yeah. Um, then some other stuff happened. There was more back and forth videos, and and then this week, uh, Digital Homicide decided to file. Uh, a lawsuit. They're suing him for libel, correct? Uh, a couple of different things. Libel is one of them. <laughs> uh, what was it? Libel, slander, and assault. Although mm. the uh, this um, this article notes that assault is on there because it is sort of a 
libel is like a subheader of it within yeah. the way you file lawsuits. So it actually is supposed to be there and doesn't literally mean that. Um, um, they're asking for $2.26 million in direct product damage because everybody knows if this had an Avon slaughtering grounds, it would have been a breakaway success and they would have made millions. Exactly. Well, the total is $10 million. Right. Because then there's an additional uh, $4.3 million in emotional, reputational, and financial distress. Of course. And $5 million in punitive damage requests, which adds up to $10.76 million. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the judge should say. Yeah, the, well, I think the no. judge will say that. So, yeah. digital homicide's based in Arizona. Yes. Uh, and they uh, spend an awful lot of time going after Jim Sterling instead of making better video games. Instead of making better video games. Uh, and they, um, they're they representing themselves in this lawsuit. They have no attorney. Shocking. Shocking. Uh, they well, also. Obviously, they didn't have enough money to hire an attorney because nobody bought slaughtering grounds because Jim Sterling told them it was terrible. Exactly. It's it Jim all, Sterling's fault. It all makes sense. The dots connect. <laughs> um, tie that yarn around the push pin. <laughs> so, they started a GoFundMe page. They did a GoFundMe for their suit? They did. <laughs> and it was, and it got blasted and they took it down. But don't worry, they've put it back up. So, you can look. <laughs> You can look at this online defamation lawsuit. Oh my god, they've got a hundred and ninety dollars. Ninety dollars. Yeah, they want seventy five thousand. I like to. I hope that like that hundred ninety dollars is from one of the developers, like grandmas or something. Well, it's from six people. So all of the developers' grandmas. Yeah, my assumption is that it's their close friends who've donated the money that they were going to donate. Uh, yeah, man. We'll show that Jim Sterling, the big meanie. Internet bully. It's been up for two days total. Yes. And that's how much money it has raised. Uh, so it's... I, I'm calling it right now. It's not going to make They're it. They're making a solid hourly wage. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, not going to not gonna do it. Not going to happen. Um, so this suit's probably not going to go anywhere. No. In the event that it does, I'm sure we'll continue to report on it. Um, I want to bring something up, actually, from last week's show, just in the light of... Um, I was thinking about this, too, the PewDiePie thing. Yeah, in light of us, especially with us saying, this game's terrible, it's good no one bought him. I believe that, because based on what I've seen of this game, it's terrible. It sucks. It should be better. <laughs> but um, last week we talked about um, Bear Simulator, an indie game being built by pretty much one guy, I believe, um, which was played by PewDiePie, um, internet YouTube sweetheart PewDiePie, who said, this game is terrible, take this video as a PSA to not buy this game, which led the developer to, without saying it was because of this, but I have a hard time believing it's because of anything else, yeah. um, to say he doesn't want to work on the game anymore. He's done. He's thrown in the towel, because now there's all this negative perception of it um, since then. Uh, and in that case, I think it's really upsetting, because Bear Simulator is a very inoffensive game. <laughs> <laughs> it's a game where you, you're a bear and you go and you smell stuff and you eat food and you put on hats and you fight woodland creatures. Exactly. That's it. The That's things the game. that bears do. And it's fine. It's totally fine. It's a cheap little indie game. Whatever. If Goat Simulator flies, Bear Simulator flies. Bear yeah. Simulator is more of a game than Goat Simulator is. <laughs> and that game was crazy successful. Um, but it. We we talked about a little bit last week how it kind of the burden comes to these YouTube personalities and these game critics and let's players. Their words carry a lot of weight, especially for indie game developers. For someone like PewDiePie who has fifty million followers to say this game is terrible, don't buy it. That's gonna that's gonna hurt that game. It's going to. I don't care what you say. It's gonna. And for Jim Sterling, even who has substantially fewer followers than Pewdie PewDiePie. For him to say this game is terrible holds water. Yeah. People are not, people are going to, who may have looked at that game before, are going to ignore it and just crap on it because Jim Sterling said it's bad. Yep. The key difference here being Slaughtering Grounds actually looks terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm not sure where we draw the line. Because even a bad game, there's a degree of, of subjectivity to get video games. There's objectivity as well, I guess, but a lot of it is, you know, you, you your mileage may vary. Some people are going to like, some people probably like Slaughter and Ground a lot, 
I'm assuming the developers like it a lot. I'm not true. There's some... <laughs> So where do we draw the line here where we say, this person shouldn't have said that, or this person is doing people a good service by saying this? Because I say we're kind of on the side. I mean, disagree with me if, if you do. Well, see, this is what's interesting, because last week, I we were in disagreement about the PewDiePie story. Were we? I think we were. I don't think we were in total disagreement. Well, total not total disagreement. disagreement. Okay. But we were, but we did not, we weren't exactly on the okay. same page. Yeah. Um, because I do think that a little more of the onus is on the game dev. Not right. that the YouTuber doesn't, you know, their, their being certainly affects things in a significant right. way. Right. Um, but it's interesting because you have, I don't like either of the dev reactions in either of these scenarios. Me neither. Um, I don't think the Bear Simulator guy should have reacted yeah. the way he did and just quit. But it's interesting because it's like his reaction is like I submit to the will of the internet yeah, and yeah. I give and I and I surrender. Lord PewDiePie has deemed deemed me unworthy. Yeah. Um <laughs> and uh right. whereas with Digital Hominus side they said we're gonna fight this tooth and nail. And now they just look like yeah. assholes. Yeah so <laughs> I, neither of those responses are correct. Yeah. In my opinion what should happen is they should Try to actually change the game in a way that makes it better, or right. or speak in a civil way to the YouTuber to be like, "Hey, right. you didn't like this. How can I change it to make it to make it better? Yeah. Like, what can we do to fix this?" Uh, that's that's what what I what I would have liked out of both of these situations. <laughs> um, but uh, oh, there is. I mean, one of the things we do know is that uh, the the developer saying. Uh, I surrender. It certainly certainly works out a lot better for them than them trying to fight back. Because oh man, all the different things that happened to yeah. the uh, to the digital homicide people. Yeah. Uh, after they pissed off the internet, there's some bad stuff. I mean, we know that the internet tends to react in horrible ways. Oh, it's knee jerk all over the place. Yeah, I mean the, this kind of thing. The, the 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 guy who runs a digital homicide was sent a package of feces in the mail. <laughs> this come on, come on. Um, okay, what were but, the people at the then, post office doing? <laughs> he should have caught that. <laughs> yeah. that, could, that is sort of hazardous material. It depends. Yeah, but like in most cases, I feel like they catch that. <laughs> Which actually brings me to something else about this lawsuit. That is another reason why this lawsuit isn't going to work out. Is one of the things it posits is that oh, all these terrible things happened to us, the game developers, yeah. because you said this horrible thing. But it's not like Jim Sterling specifically told people no. to do this. Jim these Sterling said his part and a bunch of other people decided to do more stuff. Yeah, like you said, like he's not ordering anybody to do this. And he and he can't be responsible for all of these people on the internet, even though no. we we as we were saying, his name uh and his opinion does influence. Yeah. But he still can't be held responsible for But nothing for in the... any of his videos could be construed as, hey, mail these guys poop. Yeah, like, <laughs> harass these people. Yeah. He never says that. He just says, don't buy their game because it sucks. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, a lot of the lawsuit sort of posits that he is responsible I for that. There, there's an interesting precedent here, too, because this is such a problem with indie games, because you'll see with AAA titles all the time, people saying, don't buy this game because it sucks. But in that case, it's never really an issue. I guess. Well, it's because the game it's companies... It's going to do fine anyway in their big corporations. Yeah, they're comp like, even if it's going to significantly hurt the corporation, like, let's say it was... Um, one of the Fable games. Okay. Or, or like, um, something like like Goddess, right? Mm. Um, we A lot of people railed against that, and people talked very negatively to Molyneux about it. Yes. Um, but the worst things he ever said was like, oh, well, you just don't understand. Yeah. Um, cause, cause he's worked in this corporate environment and understands like that yeah. there's a line and you tell so with indie devs perhaps are, can be a bit thinner skinned. Yeah. And they, and they don't, with the criticism. yeah. And they don't have any kind of, like, because they haven't worked at a big company, they don't understand, like, how the system yeah, works. like, this is a guy in his basement making a game. Yeah. He, there's no deeper thing going on here, <laughs> so. Oh, well, whatever you guys think, you, our listeners, think about this, go post about it on our Facebook, or Twitter, or whatever. 
And so tell us what you think. Do you think PewDiePie's in the wrong? Do you think Jim Sterling's in the wrong? Do you think either of the developers are more in the wrong? Well, I mean, Slaughtering Grounds developers are obviously more in the wrong, but go like, give us your opinions. We'd love to hear. Um, what we got now? We got a really confusing story. I hate this story already. <laughs> it's bad. So a while back now, Valve tried to create a mod store on Steam to purchase mods for games. Specifically for the game Skyrim. Specifically for Skyrim was the first game they were doing, yes. Um, and this was going to be a place where developers could put their mods at a price that they set and people could pay that price to get that mod. And the idea was to have the developers of the mods get a return on it. Because up until now, all this modding community, they do this pro bono for the game community. Yeah. They just make mods and you can get them. Uh, so now this added some more, like, more incentive for the developers, basically, yeah. to update and keep working on their mods. Now, when we talked about this, we tried to weigh all the pros and cons here. We sort of came out on the side of paid mods, maybe not such a bad idea. Yeah. If it's regulated properly. Right. Which is difficult, and clearly it wasn't this first. Time. No, it was not. It there went down all sorts in, uh, of issues. It went down in a number of days, I yeah. believe. People got super mad. There were a number of actual problems such as one of the mods included in a mod pack being there without the consent of the person who made it. Yeah. Things like that. Um, and also the the confusing territory of what if this mod that you can pay for contains a smaller mod made by someone else? Is that second person getting money from this too? The answer is probably no. But you need to be aware of what... Each mod is made out of. You download a huge mod, it probably contains 15 mods made by different people. Mm -hmm. So Lots of code in there. A lot to be aware of. So Valve's trying to do this again, though. This time they're doing it with Dota 2. And they've changed their whole model of it to into a terribly confusing model. Frankly horrible model. <laughs> Frankly horrible. I... I was trying to read this article. I was trying to read this article before the show. We posted this to Facebook. Yeah. Uh, so you can go and check it out. It's it's an interview that Valve did with PC Gamer from March 14th. With uh, Mr... What's the guy's name? Ryan Chalky Brush. Ratchiapo? Rassiapo? Just call him Chalky Brush. Right? Just call him Chalky Brush. <laughs> so. Or Raichop. Raichok. <laughs> I don't know what his name make, is. Making nicknames for his nickname. Yeah. Uh, part of the Rosh Pit Champions team. If you know about Dota, I'm sure you know who that is. I don't. Um, in order to get a creator's perspective on this system. So, it's an interview with Valve and this guy. Yeah. Who is a mod creator and custom game creator for Dota. Dota apparently added the ability to create custom games, a la uh, old, like, Warcraft and Starcraft type stuff. Yeah, they added this, um, what, like, last year, I think? Yeah, yeah. Uh, last September, I believe. And this system for paid mods, quote-unquote, mm -hmm. runs entirely through these custom games. Yes. These, this doesn't affect regular Dota 2 at all. So, so now what you, the listener, are probably thinking is, oh, someone makes a custom game, and then I purchase it from the store, and then I can play it. No, that's no, not that how it makes works. too much sense. Way too much sense. <laughs> this is, you can play all of the custom games for free. All the time. You don't have to worry about time. paying anything. There's not, none of that's happening. No. But you can pay $1 a month, which goes 70-30 to the developer and to Valve, so more in the favor of the developer, which is nice. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, to acquire a custom game pass, which the that's a bad name. It is super unclear what that means because it, it's supposed to sound like season passes, right? But I don't know why they want it to sound like DLC because it's not really. It's not. It sort of is, but not exactly. It's DLC that you pay for for a month and then they take it away. Yeah. So you pay this dollar a month, it doesn't automatically renew each month. You have to do it yourself. Yeah. And what this does is it gives you access to special content in custom games. Specifically cosmetic stuff, but also things like And they keep loot. saying that it's all cosmetic content, but then it says that the custom game pass 
the the Rosh Pit Champions game that debuts with the custom game pass. Um, which is, uh, is it turns Dota into Gauntlet, basically. Yeah, yeah it's a co-op dungeon crawl yeah. thing. Will give you extra character slots, stash space, and an EXP and loot boost for a month. So they say this is all cosmetic. That's not cosmetic. No. None of that's cosmetic. <laughs> that's game direct gameplay stuff. Especially the loot and the experience points. And I guess it's a co-op game? Yeah, you're so not fighting against other players, so it's not, not like you're going to have an upper hand over that. But they keep saying this is cosmetic, this is cosmetic, this is cosmetic, but it's not. It's already not. <laughs> but the other thing is, because it's only, even though it's not only cosmetic, it's only in custom games, so it's not actually affecting your leaderboards in actual Dota. So why would you want it? Yeah. If you can just play the game for free... Normally. At first I thought what they were going for with this was Hat Simulator. Right. Um, like they're gonna just do tons of new little things all the time that you can pay for, like T TF2 hats. Yeah, but because it doesn't affect the main game, mm -hmm. I feel like that, the popularity that would come with that is just out the window. Right. So I don't understand if this is going to make them any money? Because the think goal is will. still to make the mod creators or custom game creators money. But yeah, like this model doesn't really strike me as one that people are going to grab onto. But at the same time, Dota 2 has a huge following, has lots of people, maybe they'll shell out money for it anyway. I guess. But I don't, like if I was playing it, I don't know why I would ever bother to get this. Because I'm neither like, oh, I. well, I can already play the mod. Because I, neither of us play Dota 2, but I can speak, like this makes me think, like what if you're playing The Witcher 3, and you can pay a dollar a month to get an extra slot for potions and 10% bonus experience. I don't want that. I don't want to pay money for that. It doesn't matter. No. <laughs> and this is it's the same thing. I Unless there's some difference that I'm totally missing here. That's what we're looking at. And again, at. this is confusing. It is. Uh, so maybe we are missing something, but I don't think we are. I don't think we are. <laughs> so, I mean, you get a lot of stuff. Like, the boosts are significant. You go from, like, 6 stash space to 24, 4 character slots to 12, 50% increased chance of finding rare items, and 10% XP gain. But this strikes me as, like, pre-order content equivalent, where it's like, pre-order the game and you get the, the I don't want to play the game sword that gives you plus 50% bonus experience points so you don't have to play the game as much. <laughs> but that's what it strikes me as. It's this kind of nothing reward that is super easy to add into the game and makes people think and feel like they're getting something significant for their money, but they're not. Which comes off to me as, if this is what they're debuting with, I'm afraid to see what they go into from here. Because they say, we're going to keep giving you new custom content, and we're going to keep giving you new reasons to come back to the game, and bug fixes, and all this stuff. But this just seems like a gateway into making things that seem like value, but aren't. Yeah. A la pre-order bonuses and DLC content and all that stuff. Um, one other thing, though, that's kind of interesting about this uh, is when you've got the... Um one of the problems with the Skyrim things that we addressed was the uh, the copying of code yeah. um, and having mods that had other people's work in right. them. Uh, so with this, if any of that stuff kind of comes up, because it's a monthly subscription, everyone can be like, oh, well, this is using someone else's content. I'm going to unsubscribe. So that's good. Yeah. You have a means of bailing out of it. Which is, yeah, which is a nice solution to that problem, yeah. I suppose. And Valve says that they're going to monitor it, and if they see things that are harmful, or like like developers putting up things that could be harmful or, or negatively impact the community, they're going to deal with it. But I don't know how much I trust them to actually moderate this effectively. I mean, they I certainly... Just don't know. One of the things that I got... Especially if this is their benchmark of extra character slots. <laughs> their benchmark. Bonus experience. Like. Uh, I mean, I got super mad at them when they messed up the Skyrim mods, because as as I had said, and yeah. as, as you had said when they first tried that, as I was like, first day... It's like, okay, if they regulate this tightly, it'll, it could totally work. But they didn't. And then they didn't. 
And I got mad because I'm like, Valve, you make so much money. Day one, they had already failed to regulate it. Yes. <laughs> I was like, Valve, you make so much money, you can afford to just hire extra people yeah. to regulate this. They're rolling in the box. And the whole scheme is, the, the whole reason that they got it so they can roll in more bucks. Yeah. Um. So, I don't know if I have faith in them to regulate the, the Dota stuff, but maybe. Uh, the only other anecdotal thing I have to add to the story is, uh, some of, some people I know, uh, stream Dota, mm -hmm. uh, on Twitch and they do so religiously. Yes. Um, they're not, like, pro player level, but they play it all the time. Uh, and I had asked them, uh, do you know, like, I'd asked them some of the names of some of the custom mods, I'm like, have you ever played any of these? Mm -hmm. uh, and they were like, no, we don't know what they are. And I, was like, <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, well, they're part of this whole pay mod system. Have you heard about this? And he said, no, we've heard nothing That about brings it. up an interesting thought. Don't most people who play Dota just want to play Dota? Yeah, that. well, that's what I'm getting at with this. Yeah. All the people I know who play Dota don't play any of the custom stuff. No, they, they just, just want the same thing over and over and over again. Which is one of the reasons I don't play Dota, because <laughs> I find it mind-numbingly boring. Um... Yeah, but uh, yeah, like the 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 mod that turned it into Gauntlet, I was like, oh, I would I would play that. Yeah, that sounds interesting. But then I watched gameplay of it, and I'm like, I think I'll just play Gauntlet instead. Yeah, why don't I just play you know, <laughs> yeah. a better version of this? <laughs> uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll follow this because I want to know where this goes. If next week they've taken it down, I guess we'll know where it has gone. Yeah. Oh, although the the internet has not reacted super harshly to it yet, it's mixed. It's mixed. Uh, although when I talked to people about it, their, uh, as I said, their initial response was, I, I haven't played any of these custom games, plus I, uh, I haven't heard about this, this system that Valve's instituting, although if they're instituting a system where I have to pay for mods, I hate it. Right. And I'm just like, well, that's exactly the response I expected. <laughs> Them's the breaks. Uh, so Game Developers Conference happened. And as a part of that, they had the Game Developers Choice Awards, um, which gave out... It was yet another award show for video games. It was a lot of these <laughs> towards the end of the year and beginning of the next year. Uh, so I pull up... Uh, I pulled up the full list of winners here. Uh, and from top to bottom, best debut... There's Because there's some interesting car uh, categories here. Moon Studios for Ori and the Blind Forest. Oh, so I'd say it's pretty pretty good. For a first game, they did a bang-up job. Uh, best Audio, Crypt of the Necro Dancer. Oh, that does have great audio. I have seen getting a lot of praise. I've not played it myself yet, however. Uh, Innovation Award for Her Story, which is cool, because that game did a lot of interesting stuff. It was innovative. <laughs> it was innovative. It's hard to even call it a game in some ways, but it's it's interesting. Uh, best Technology, Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. Mm. That game was real good. I'm more, playing it. more like your technology probably can't run it, because it's too My advanced. My computer runs it so good! <laughs> I can't even believe it. I, you can probably run that game on, like, a toaster. The Publish are amazing. <laughs> they develop a game so good. <laughs> um, best Visual Art, also to Ori and the Blind Forest. Uh, best Narrative to Her Story. Best Design to Rocket League. Best handheld mobile game to her story. I didn't realize that was on here. Yeah, neither did I. Uh, audience award was given to Life is Strange, and Game of the Year was given to Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. Hmm. Uh, which now, uh, when we were going through other award shows, neither of us have played Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. I have started playing it since I played through the first game and the second game prior, and now I've started playing the third. And man, does that game deserve all the awards it got! <laughs> That that is that is some kind of video game. Her story is on mobile. It's five dollars. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. I'd say that game's worth five dollars. Very reasonable price. Oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah, man. Uh, speaking of reasonably priced games, just a little aside before we go back to the game developers conference stuff. Um, a little indie game came out at the end of February um, that we didn't talk about, and I saw very little hype about or hubbub. Um, called Stardew Valley. Oh up, yeah, um, uh, February twenty sixth. Um, I've been playing it a little bit. It's fifteen dollars. You can grab it on Steam. It's only for PC right now. This game was developed by one guy Just over the course. Guy. One guy over the course of four years. And man, does it look good! It's goddamn amazing. Yeah, it's remarkable. It's if you like Harvest Moon, Animal Crossing, Minecraft, 
any of those sorts of things, you need to try this game out. Because he took the best elements of all those things, crammed them all together with a nice, like, Super Nintendo pixel art style. It feels like you're playing an old Harvest Moon game, but with so much more content, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's great. It's really, really cool, charming little game. The fact that one guy made it is staggering to me. Um, it's already sold close to half a million copies, I'm pretty sure. Ooh. So this guy's on Cloud 9 right now, because <laughs> he was just making this as, like, a fun project for himself. Yeah. Um, there's a cool interview with the developer of it with PC Gamer as well uh, that just gets into some interesting stuff about it, like how he started making it and how it ended up where it is now and what he's thinking about doing in the future now that it's been so successful. But um, go on and support this guy. If you want a game like that, Go on Steam, take a look at it. It's only $15, and you will get your money's worth. 100%. It's real cool. That's my shameless plug of the day. <laughs> um, uh, my opposite of of uh, internet critics bashing game, indie games. I will praise this indie game to the ends of the earth. Uh, GDC. The developer of The Witcher 3... Um, had a little talk, and they talked about why developers should talk to their fans more, and that the worst thing a developer can do in response to fan criticisms is be silent. See, this is funny, because the first story we did today tells me that that's not the worst thing they yeah. can do. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> um, but no, I think it, there there is a, a good point to take away from the fact that devs should talk more to fans. Yeah. Uh, co-founder of CD Projekt Red, uh, Markin or Marson, I'm not sure, Iwinski, um, talked through the branding, marketing, and PR process for Witcher 3. Um, and he says that he believes he had three, they had three pillars that made the game a huge success. First, it was a good game. So that's a good start. Yeah. Second, they had a gamer-centric value proposition, quote-unquote, which basically means that the value of the game, they wanted the game to be geared towards giving specifically the player the most bang for their buck that they could. They weren't angling this as for them getting the most bang for their buck for pricing of the game and sales of the game. They wanted the player to feel that they got absolutely what they deserved for the price tag and more. Um, and that goes on to include the DLC packs that have come out and are coming out for the game. Um, and then thirdly, um, the team talked about the game directly to fans, and he thinks that that's something that large publisher teams totally fail at. They don't, like, directly address fans and talk to them about game, the game during development. Um, and he said, you know, coming up with simple ways to describe the game to people in different groups. Um, so talking to mainstream players or the media, like, clearly the the you can talk about this game and hardcore video game people and fantasy game people will, will get it if you go into details with them. Yeah. But he came up with things like, uh, the world doesn't need a hero, it needs a professional. You know, stupid taglines that, that, that corporate people and media people are going to latch on to yeah. to make people notice the game. And then, for people who are more casual gamers and want to know what they're looking at, Skyrim in a Game of Thrones sauce. Mm -hmm. This works. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, he also points to uh, Star Wars Battlefront is how uh, he showed a video about uh, angry fan reactions to the expensive DLC content, and that he thinks that the issue wasn't with the DLC itself, but how EA had like completely failed explaining why they were doing this the way they were doing it to the players. They just said, here's the game. This is what the game is. Here's all the DLC. This is what it is. And that's what we were given as the consumer. Yeah. There was no description given of their rationale, why they released the game the way, that, the way they did, why they decided to do the DLC instead of including this in the main game. And that got people mad. Especially when your DLC is priced at 15 bucks a pop for a total of 60 for all four packs, which doubles the cost of the game. A game that's prime criticism was that it didn't have the content of a $60 game in the <laughs> first place. So it's, it's bad. And EA did nothing to remedy that. They just didn't say anything. Um, so I guess what to take away from this is, I think this guy makes a lot of good points. And you can't really argue with the success that The Witcher 3 had. 
and the fact that tons of people knew about it, tons of people were excited about it, and in spite of criticisms of it prior to release, of the graphics being downgraded, things like that, CD Projekt addressed those concerns. They explained to people, yes, we have changed some of the ways the graphics are being rendered. We've changed the lighting system. We had to do that for performance reasons. Like, they explained specifically why they did what they did, and then said, but we assure you, the quality of the game itself has not been reduced. I think that it's nice. I think that uh, no other big company, specifically not EA, uh, will take anything away from that. I also agree with that. Uh, because, <laughs> and the main reason is because he, he brings Battlefront up as a really reasonable example. Yeah. Uh, but that game still sold super, super it well. Did. So the only message the company is getting from that is, well, it sold really well, so I guess we did everything right. Yeah. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, it really needs because internet outrage is one thing, but you can really tell that a game is truly terrible when no one buys it. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, I'm, and I don't think he's saying, and I'm not saying either, that Battlefront is a terrible game. No, one might say that it's a terrible value for your money. Yeah, well, you'd think that at least you would see some sort of reflection in the sales, right? Yeah. Be- that people were mad about it, but it just sold so amazingly well. Yeah, and I'm sure the DLC packs are going to sell incredibly well, as well too. Yeah. Um, and he- the thing is, even if somebody gets annoyed with the DLC after the fact, they they already have the game. Like, say they've already bought the game, and then they found out, what, I have to pay as much for DLC? Well, I already have the game. <laughs> so I might as well. Might as well. I guess I kind of have to, otherwise I'm not going to have all the stuff. So it kind of, it gets you in a, it's kind of slimy in that sense, yeah. I think. That they, they, and EA knows that. Mm-hmm. They know that they will kind of walk people into buying the DLC if they purchase the game in the first place. Because most people don't have the restraint to say, nah, I don't need it. Especially if they like the game well enough. But it, but it is interesting that he's, that, as I said at the beginning of that piece, that yeah. he says silence is the worst thing you can do. But I'm like, man, if if you're like EA and you're just silent on these things, yeah, you'll get a bunch of people on the internet blowing up at you. But if you then are annoying and petty like Digital Homicide and <laughs> post a bunch of mean things specifically at the people who didn't like your content... People will send poop to you. Yeah, the internet will <laughs> blow up in a way you don't even understand. No one can understand. <laughs> it's like the most frightening incarnation of the mob mentality imaginable. So, so yeah, I'm pretty sure that uh, we're... <laughs> <laughs> that uh, silence is not the worst thing. It's just a bad thing. Mm. But actually being mean to the fans is the worst thing. Uh, this next article, also from GDC, is about game emulation. Uh, Frank Cifaldi, uh, head of restoration at developer Digital Eclipse, oh. um, took the stage to talk about game preservation, which I think is really interesting, um, especially in the context of emulators. Um, emulation, I'm sure most people who would be listening to this podcast know what it is, but in case you don't, it's a software process uh, by which programmers can make one computer pretend to be a different kind of computer so that it can run programs that it would not normally run. Yeah. Um, You will see this used very often for people to play Nintendo games on their laptop. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Uh, Sometimes Sega Genesis games. Sometimes Sega Genesis games. Um, You may also think, huh, that sounds kind of like what happens when I go on the virtual console and buy Super Metroid on my Wii U. It is. <laughs> it's the That's same it thing, is. basically. Um, and his point, Mr. Spaldi's point here, is that um, according to the Film Foundation, over half of the films made before 1950 are gone. Um, and he doesn't mean by that you can't buy them on DVD. He means they're gone. They don't exist anymore. Oh. And films produced before 1920, that number jumps to 80%. So these movies have just vanished. They're no longer... They were made, they were watched, they were probably enjoyed. We'll never be able to see them. Ever. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of weird to think about. (laughs) Well, Um, uh, I've actually read about stuff like this with uh, a lot of the B-movies that were released only on VHS in the 80s during that big boom. They've deteriorated. Um, Yeah, and you just... They were never transferred over to to DVD, so... And VHSs don't have the longest shelf shelf life. So there are movies that in that vein that are disappearing, although people are also have, because people are sort of acting to preserve at this same time in history, but they're trying to do it 
for a bunch of different things, since they're only going back 30 years for the 80s stuff, it's much easier for them to get that stuff preserved. Right. Um, But for the the films from that long ago, much more difficult. Um, So, uh, Mr. Cifaldi brings up the point of, is anybody doing this for video games? Is anybody preserving these video games? Those cartridges. From back in the day, those cartridges and tapes for the Commodore 64 and things like that. So that they'll be around in the future and people can go back and enjoy them and look at this history. Um, and he believes that this needs to start becoming more of a thing. Like, people need to be aware of this and start doing it. And that emulation is the best possible way to do this. Because fortunately, all these games are digital in some form already. And ergo, it's pretty easy to transfer the, for them into a different digital format that can be played on an emulator. Um, and we already have emulators that can play all these old game consoles. We have emulators that can play up through, like, PS2 and Wii games yeah. on a computer at this point, um, which is pretty amazing. So we're kind of there, but at the same time, like, who's going to record all of it? And arcade games are another big thing. What happens when all the cabinets disappear? Mm. you got these arcade game emulators, though. You can play all sorts of weird crap. Pistol Shogun. Pistol Daimyo. Pistol Daimyo. Pistol Daimyo, like you and me played. Oh, the best game. Who knows what that game is? (laughs) You don't, listener. I'm sure you don't. (laughs) Who knows what they're saying? Only Japanese people. Only Japanese people. There's a Kappa in that game. He throws cucumbers at you. It makes sense, but it's still weird. (laughs) Remember the level with the floating spinning rocks? I do. We couldn't beat it. <laughs> we tried really hard. Um, but the interesting thing is, he says that uh, emulation has long been associated with piracy, which is also true, because people download these ROMs of games, they don't pay anything for them. Um, and these are copyrighted games. Uh, they just download them and play them. And in particular, uh, Nintendo has a big aversion towards it, um, pointing to their official statement on the issue, which is available on their corporate website for the last 16 years. <laughs> Nintendo sa- It says, how come Nintendo does not take steps towards legitimizing Nintendo emulators? And Nintendo says, emulators developed to play illegally copied Nintendo software promote piracy. That's like asking why Nintendo doesn't legitimize piracy. It doesn't make any business sense. It's that simple and not open to debate. But this language, as Mr. Cifaldi claims, is disingenuous because the Wii U's virtual console is just an emulator. Yeah. So it's it's weird. There's <laughs> well, some gray area here, a little bit. Uh, it's interesting because you have. Uh, it makes sense that Nintendo would be the most uh, testy about this stuff yes. because their older their games, games are so emulated. Well, their games are super emulated, <laughs> but that's because their older games are the ones that everybody remembers and everybody right. wants to play. Also, still. in the case of Game Boy games, a lot of those old Game Boy cartridges had an internal battery on which the save game function ran, mm-hmm. and most of those don't work anymore. Oh. You can play the game, but you can't save it. Oh. Pokemon, in particular. Um, I think Pokemon Silver and Gold, in particular, most cartridges for that game are dead at this point. In that sense, well, you can play them, but you can't save your game, and in Pokemon, that's kind of a deal-breaker. You can't, you can't replace the battery? Is it, I assume it would be like a watch battery or something. I don't know if you can replace it. It would involve opening up the cartridge well, and, definitely, and, yeah. and removing some things. <laughs> I don't know, because I don't know if it's if it's soldered in there, Yeah, if the battery's directly attached to the, the chip. I don't know. Um, he says it has an interesting quote here uh, about this whole thing with Nintendo and how the Wii U is just an emulator in that sense. Um, I would posit, Cifaldi said, that Nintendo downloaded Super Mario Brothers from the internet and sold it to you. <laughs> Which is an interesting thought. And uh, Polygon, who, this, or who published this article, reached out to Nintendo for a comment on the accusation, to which they responded emphatically, Nintendo is not using ROMs downloaded from the internet. But can they prove that? <laughs> can, can you prove it, Nintendo? Can they prove that? I don't know. Regardless, N- Nintendo's not going to budge on this. This no. is what it's going to be. But it's really interesting to think about that, like, Nintendo's like, oh, we got to sell Super Mario Brothers on the virtual console. Just get a ROM off the internet. It works the same. Like, that's just what it is. <laughs> so, like, who knows? Um, I think this guy makes a lot of interesting points. He does. Um, I agree that um, preserving these video games is very important um, and should be done. And I agree with him that emulators are a great way to do it. Um, and I kind of, I, I never thought about it before, but I like his thoughts on 
all these other companies doing creating emulators through their consoles that are like legal. Yeah, but you pay for the game. Yeah, which is I don't think there's about anything wrong with that. But I do like his theory that like couldn't they have just grabbed one of these ROMs off the internet and just like rebranded it? Like to you, like I sold it, resold it to you. Because even Sony has like you can buy PlayStation One games. Um, Xbox has has start started allowing you to download original Xbox games in the past couple years. So eh, something to think about, something that you want. <laughs> uh, you know, it reminds me we did a story a little while back about how uh, Sega, who was Capcom, I think it was Sega, it must have been Sega, yeah, was uh, offering a bunch of free games. As a promotional thing yes. that you could download on Steam. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I downloaded Golden Axe, and they have an emulator that when you download one of those games, it installs the emulator, and oh. then it's like any Sega Genesis games that you buy off of Steam. Then when you open them, they run in they emulator. run through their emulator. Yeah, the official emulator that they have set up. That's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not a great emulator either, but uh, well, it's to be expected. Um, this is a quick story. This is the last GDC thing. Um, because creator of Res, oh. everybody's favorite psychedelic rhythm. I enjoyed game. that game. Very it's a good much. time. Yeah. Uh, for the PS2, <laughs> Mr. Tetsuya Mizuguchi, um, did a presentation about the game because they're coming out with a remake of it, I believe. Um, it's going to include yeah, a new level. They already as well. did like an HD version. They're doing like a ago. super HD version. It's happening. Just release a new um, game, dude. <laughs> uh, he spoke on the origins of his rhythm, rhythm game and its hidden meaning. Whoa. Can you guess? I want you to guess what the hidden meaning of Rez is. is, it, is because it... when I read it, I was like, of course that's what it is. <laughs> oh my gosh. Is it all about, like, life? About conception? Is that what it's about? <laughs> Look at the genius over here. <laughs> so the game presents itself as you are a hacker yeah. breaking into computer systems. Yep. Yeah. Um, in like a digital landscape, like your your reboot, basically. Um, but no, Rez's true meaning is that it is a uh, metaphor for conception and birth. The player avatar is a sperm cell traveling and trying to connect with an egg. A metaphor the developer tried to communicate through the abstract player forms and Rez's ending movie. <laughs> a shocker! It's about sex. <laughs> Whoa. Who saw that coming? <laughs> you know, actually, uh, Rez, um, the way it, the way it goes, if you ever read any William Gibson stuff, mm -hmm. the guy who inspired, uh, The Matrix, yeah. whenever they talk about the, the hacker in his books like Neuromancer, uh, going into the net and, yeah. like, destroying viruses and, like, doing things, it's described very much like Rez yeah. is. Yeah. Um, um, there's a lot to this article. Um, he goes into a lot about the development of the game and how, like, he and his dev team would go clubbing to get a feel for the trance music and stuff they wanted. It was, it's interesting. It's fun. They just um, wanted to drop acid and I'll, make a game. I'll throw this up on our, uh, Facebook page. It's an article on Polygon from the 17th. And if you're interested, give it a read. Uh, look at this Xbox news. Phil Spencer, what's that going on? again. What's, what's up with this Xbox news? So we learned on March 14th. Uh, that, um, Xbox, the X-Bone, uh, their Xbox Live service for playing over the internet is going to change things up. They're going to be, they're going to support cross-platform multiplayer. Look at this. So Spencer's building bridges. <laughs> Making peace. <laughs> Uh, it's really funny. It's like the, the worse Microsoft does in sales, the, uh, the better decisions they make. <laughs> I've always thought cross-platform play was a great idea. Yeah. Um, as long as you got servers that can, like, handle it, it's an awesome idea. Uh, it's more fun for everybody. Get PC in there. Why not? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a little bit about that in the article, but... Uh, yeah. It's a pretty brief little article. I mean... The, uh, the, the one that's supported right now, because it's going sort of, like, game by game, yeah. the one that's going to be supported uh, is going to be Rocket League. That makes complete Make sense. Totally. Um... The the only problem is, uh, and there's been some stories in the last like day or two about this, uh, is that the snag might actually not be uh, with Microsoft, but might be with Sony. So Sony's mm. like, well, we don't want you to come and play. Yes. Yeah. So, oh, I gotta ask. 
<laughs> okay, I got rid of the ads. We'll have to see. Uh, no, but there's uh, there's a little article a Sony exec gave a quote about it because people are asking them a lot about it because the the cross platform Xbox stuff was just announced. And uh, let's see what he said. Um, what's his name? I have an article from Techno Buffalo. <laughs> um, they talked with uh, oh Eurogamer. This is a quote from a Eurogamer article. Uh, Caught up with Sony Worldwide Studios head. Oh god, I'm gonna butcher his name. Uh, Shuhei Yoshida. You got it. Oh, not too far off there. You're pretty good. Uh, Pretty good kid. (laughs) And they ask him uh, about this, Um, and he's he says because PC is an open platform, it's it's much more straightforward. Uh, Connecting to different closed networks is much more complicated, so we have to work with developers and publishers to understand what it is they're trying to accomplish. Uh, We also have to look at the technical aspect, and the technical aspect could be the easiest. (laughs) We also have to look at policy issues and business issues as well. So it sounds like Microsoft just went ahead and decided this and didn't, like, consult anyone. And and Sony's still kind of like, eh. Here. Yeah, so he's like, wait, we don't want you on our servers. What are you yeah, doing? Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to see how that shakes out. So that's going to be interesting. Uh, next up, we have a possible leaked image of the Nintendo NX controller. Possible. This possible. Is huge rumors, everybody. So a while ago, there was this copyright patent like sketch. Of this weird controller that's, like, entirely a touchscreen with two little joysticks coming out of it. Yeah. Um, and it's, like, an oval shape with shoulder buttons and stuff. And now there's a real, quote-unquote, picture of it. And people are thinking this could be the NX controller and could be the way that it also is sort of a handheld system as now, well as a home console. Now, this was somebody on Reddit yeah. posted this, and they posted it on um, the 17th. 17th. Yeah. It says it because the, the picture has a date on it. Um, There's a little note that says, you will say, wow. I don't know if I would say wow to that. Yeah. Uh, So, I have my doubts that this is real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the same time, it's weird enough and off the wall enough that I wouldn't be super surprised if it ends up being real. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Especially when you look at the Wii and the Wii U, where Nintendo was like, look at this! And everyone was like, what? No, ew. (laughs) Is this a joke? Is this a joke? It's not a joke. This is a new console. That's what it is. You're, you you love it. Uh, so if they walked out on stage with one of these, I wouldn't even be surprised at this point. But I still don't think it's real. I'm yeah. not. I'm unconvinced. The uh, the other weird thing about it is in the patent there are uh, like what are they called? Uh, the little things for the so you can actually hold it. Um, the the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I ruined We're okay, now. technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, these things. Hands? No. <laughs> He's under the hands. Oh, I see. Yes, there's actually the little... the little. Um, so you can't remember the name of the either. <laughs> bananas. <laughs> uh, the, grips. The, the grippy thing. Yeah. The parts that stick out. Yeah. Um... <laughs> <laughs> and whereas in the Where photo, the rest. yes, oh, in the in the act, in the photo of the actual thing, it's just the oval part. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so it's like, okay, so how do I hold this? Yes. Um, like a Vita. Oh no, a PlayStation Vita. Vita means life. It does. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. I don't know if this is real. Maybe it is. Um, the Oculus Rift is launching. Finally, it's launching. Finally, it's coming out. Can you believe it? I don't actually believe it. I, I don't think believe it's it. gonna be another year. When at least. is it coming out? March twenty eighth. That's really soon. It's really soon. <laughs> um, we have a list of uh, thirty games at around twenty dollars per game on average. We got a drift, a space game, Adventure Time, Magic Man's Head Games, Air Mac Command. That's one game, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Albino Lullaby. Nice. I don't know what that might be. Oh. Audio Arena, Blaze Rush, Kronos, Damaged Core, Darknet, Dead and Buried, Dead Secret, Defense Grid 2 Enhanced VR Edition, <laughs> Dragon Front, Dread Halls, Eagle Flight, Edge of Nowhere, Elite Dangerous Deluxe Edition, Esper 2, 
Eve Gunjack, Eve Valkyrie Founders Pack. Fantastic Contraption. Oh, yeah, no, I've seen that. Fly to Kuma, Hero Bound, SC. I expect you to die. Yeah. <laughs> Job simulator. Yeah. Keep talking and nobody explodes. Yeah. That game's actually pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Lucky's Tale, Omega Agent, Pinball FX2 VR, Project Cars, Radial G, Rock Band VR, Rooms, Shuffle, and not to be confused with Room or The Room. No. no. The well received films. <laughs> Shuffle Puck Cantina Deluxe VR, Smashing the Battle, The Climb, Vanishing of Ethan Carter, oh. Actron Revenge, VR Sports, VR Tennis Online, Wind and Windlands, or Windlands, I, I guess Windlands. Yeah, it's Windlands. That's actually 41 games, this is 30 up here. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> uh, although some of those might not have, oh, they don't actually have launch dates. So there's 30, they're actually launching the same day. That's more games than I expected. It is. Uh, none of them sound like AAA titles. How many? Yeah, how many one. of them are more than you're in a room doing a thing? Well, certainly not rooms. Certainly oh, not although rooms. Although then again, that could be multiple rooms doing multiple things. It might so, shock hey. us. Um, there's a couple third person games. What? Um, Why? That were shown <laughs> at Oculus Rift's launch event. There's a uh, Hero Band Spirit Champion, and uh, where's this other one? And Chronos. The hands that of seems fate. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it seems like an odd choice for VR. It's a dumb choice, but at the same time, I understand if like they're just throwing a bunch of stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks. Right. Um, Ubisoft created the game Eagle Flight, where you play as an eagle. Sweet. And you fly. Yeah, I got that. <laughs> <laughs> and you catch prey. But again, um, that seems like one of those things that, like, this is a really cool concept, and it'll be fun for a half an hour, and then I... Yeah, and you can, like, fight each other, it's, like, racing and stuff, but yeah, like, it, these are, these feel like mini-games. Mm -hmm. um, Edge of Nowhere um, is a, like, horror game? A weird, like, created by uh, Insomniac? Oh. Which is a third per uh, this is a third-person game as well. Uh... And they think that it's third person because right now most players simply aren't acclimated to being in VR, and anecdotes of nausea and discomfort in first person games are very common. So they decided they wanted to ease the players into it more with a third person game, and they just really wanted to do a horror game um, where you have that fear of not knowing what's around each corner and being able to uh, and being able to like look around it. So you actually get that feeling of looking around the corner and seeing something spooky. Um, the game looks kind of neat. It looks like kind of an Arctic Explorer type thing with monsters and stuff. Got that Lovecraft feel to it. Um, and there's going to be some sort of sanity effects that are relayed to you through the VR, which could be neat. So, I mean, that seems like a bit more of a game. And in the least gamey game of all time, the laziest thing they possibly could have oh, done. No. Ubisoft Why? took popular party game Werewolf. To VR, which looks like literally you sit around a fire with some people and you guess who the werewolf is. Ugh. This looks Ugh. dumb. It has the most like creatively bankrupt canned shovelware art style they possibly could have done too. It looks like you're playing like the 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 deal or no deal Wii game. <laughs> well, that's the thing we we should expect when these these um. I don't want to call them consoles. When these with these VR headsets come out, uh, shovelware. shovelware is going to follow. Yep, it's going to be a lot of shovelware. Um, so PlayStation VR uh, follows the launch of Oculus in October 2016, um, which will be coming out. Sony uh, PlayStation VR will be coming out for three hundred ninety nine dollars. Um, lower than the HTC. Let me tell you. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's lower than the HTC and it's lower than the Oculus Rift. Um. Da, da, da. It's they gave the specs for it, a bunch of techno jargon and stuff. They showed what it's going to come with. Um, there's a uh, the PlayStation. It will not include the PlayStation Move controllers or PlayStation camera. The camera is required, so keep that in mind if you're interested in this and don't have PlayStation Move stuff. Um, interestingly, they also said it will work with all existing games and video content in a cinematic mode. I'm wondering what this is actually gonna mean. IMAX? Kind of like an IMAX thing for your comic games? Might be neat? That just annoys me, because I'm like, oh, I don't... 
Now I have to look around to get all the peripherals. Yeah, and I'm wondering like how well it's actually going to work with all these existing games that weren't developed for this at all. Yeah. Or if it's just going to look crappy. I think it's going to be weird. No, yeah. it doesn't work. So, whatever. There's also a rumor that Sony is developing a more powerful PS4. PS8. PS4.5, excuse you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, this is nothing new, I guess, because this, this whole thing of slim consoles has become a thing now. And PlayStation certainly uh, was a big proponent of that. They were. <laughs> <laughs> and then Xbox did it, too. And then there's all the different uh, Nintendo DSs. <laughs> I did really like, and this was partially only because the PS2 was out for such a, a godly amount of time. Yeah. Uh, but the slim PS2, uh, I got one of those. Yeah. Was good. Was pretty all right. A pretty big improvement on the original yeah. design. Um. Uh, there's no word on whether the official name is the PS4.5. I'm sure it is not. I'm sure it is the PS4 Slim. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, I was and, uh, would it not be that. And uh, it will include improved graphics hardware to power 4K games Whoa. and additional processing power, specifically for PlayStation VR. So I guess that makes sense, given that these two things are becoming a part of video gaming, that they would want to release an updated console with better support for them. Um, we'll see. We'll see what the price point on is. Um, Telltale Games, they're making that Batman game now. They don't have anything to show about it. Nope. But it's a Telltale game, so I'm sure it'll be a Telltale game. They talked about how, hey guys, guess it's gonna what? It's be really mature. You're gonna be Bruce Wayne for a lot of it. And I think, didn't we talk about that when we first talked about the we announcement? Did. We were like, yeah. maybe it's just Bruce Wayne making business deals. Yeah. And it actually it's seems like, that's, like that's, what, a big part of it. that's a big part of it. Um, they say that your telltale choices in the game are, a lot of them are going to involve whether you decide to do things as Batman or Bruce Wayne. So there will be moments where it's like, do you want to go beat this guy up as Batman? Or not. Or go sue him as Bruce Wayne. Or go sue him as Bruce Wayne. What's going to happen? I really hope you can play through the entire game only as Bruce Wayne. Yeah. Oh my god, that would be amazing. That would be pretty cool, actually. Because <laughs> then we can see those... You never even set foot in the back, hey? Yeah, you see those, uh, the the YouTube playthroughs. Bruce Wayne, Wayne, Bruce Wayne only playthroughs. Bruce run. <laughs> Extreme difficulty. <laughs> um, that's cool. Um, Audience-wise, they said they're going to be landing in the mature rating. Um, it'll feel like an R-rated movie if you played The Wolf Among Us or The Walking Dead, sort of the same parameters. Okay. There's going to be blood. Yeah. And people are probably going to die or something. Yeah. And Joker's in it. Because why wouldn't he be? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, and they're going for like a comic booky art style, which makes sense because when they try to do realistic, it doesn't look good. Uh... Um, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, and finally, J.J. Abrams... That's J.J. Abrams, for anyone who's not in the loop. Yeah. <laughs> um, has said that Portal and Half-Life movies are still a go and have writers. Boo! Boo. Uh, That's no good. Not that, you know, I trust J.J. Abrams to make a good movie, but they don't, they don't want to do those. No. Um, what would they even be? The Portal one would be weird. Half-Life would be weird, too. What are you going to do? Make Gordon Freeman talk? Send it away. I don't want it. Make him mute, or I don't care. <laughs> I don't care that it's a movie. Make him mute and just have him walk around and kill aliens. Make it super slow-paced and spooky and weird. Half-Life. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. I like it. Yeah. Um, Portal would just be like some weird comedy movie. <laughs> I guarantee you that's what it's gonna be. Just like the Angry Bird movie. Oh, just like that. Ugh. What games are coming out? Pokémon tournament came out yesterday. That's the Tekken Pokémon. That right? is correct. Yeah, that has a bafflingly low yeah. amount of fighting type Pokémon in it. <laughs> bafflingly low. <laughs> I mean, got Machamp in there, but got a new Hyper Dimension Neptunia game coming out. To, to, no, Monday. Yeah. Monday. Why is it coming out on Monday? I don't know. That's man. weird. You gotta get all that Hyper Dimension Neptunia. Day of the Tentacle remastered on the twenty second. Oh, nice. That's cool. Uh, Republic. Dead or Alive funny. Extreme 3. <gasps> coming out on the 24th in Asia only. <laughs> oh, Milk Cookie has made this just for you. <laughs> it's not for us anymore. <laughs> but now there's Amazon's international store. Oh Don't worry, God. we can still get it. Well set. Or you can go to Play Asia. Yeah. The people who, like, 
antagonized everyone who was happy about it not coming to the States by saying, hey, you can buy it at Play Asia. We love this crap. Uh, so, yeah. And Hyrule Warriors Legends next Friday. Um, the not so great looking 3DS port does not look of Hyrule good. Warriors. Oh, no. So, that has been the show for this week. Uh, I've been Lex. I have been Dan. And as soon as the show ends, I will stop being that person. (laughs) That will cease to be. (laughs) We're going to go into some sort of nebulous void for a while until the next broadcast, where we are without identity. (laughs) Uh, Thank you all so much for listening. Um, We're your weekly video game podcast, live news uh, about of the past week in video games. Uh, you can find us right here on chipbit.net at Chipbit Radio. You can find us on iTunes, Twitter, Steam, YouTube, and Facebook. All those places. All those places. Don't copy that floppy, um, except Twitter, where we are at DCTF Podcast. We got a full show archive on iTunes as well as the Chipbit website, and we are working on getting a full show archive on YouTube as well, if that's the way you prefer to watch I got, it. I got that going. Yeah. It's going to happen. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> look forward to that. Um, and until next week, remember. Don't copy that floppy. Remember. Don't copy that floppy. Remember.